All right, recording. Hi, everybody. Um, today is our first episode of Music King with T, and I have with me the lovely Marion Samuel Stevens. Do you want to introduce yourself, uh, Marion? Hi, I'm Marion. Uh, I live in Rockwood, Ontario. It's a small town near Guelph. And yeah, do you want to know anything else yet? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Say, say something. Something unique about yourself. Something unique about myself. Well, I love to garden. Yes, I enjoyed your photos this past summer, yeah. Yeah, I did a lot of gardening this summer. Yeah. And I also have two Cornish Rex cats. Oh, nice. Cats are like, they have very, very short hair that's quite curly. Oh, cool. And they kind of are like, so ugly they're beautiful. <laughs> I'll have to Google it. I don't think I know what those, they look like. Yeah, I've never seen a cat with curly hair. That's so cool. Yeah, they're really, they're sitting there. Oh. One of them might. Pop in. Oh. <laughs> so today I want to talk about confidence in students because I feel like it's something that, um, especially in this sort of weird world bubble that we're in with COVID, um, confidence is really affected. And then as musicians, if the confidence is in there, it's really hard to develop musical skills. That I find like the two kind of work in, you know, um, hand in hand and it's something that I as a young musician really struggled with and I think it held me back for a long time so I, I kind of want to talk today about um, some of our past experiences and how we work with our students and all that um did was something did you struggle with confidence as a, as a young artist absolutely yeah so yeah. I started off playing piano um which I which I love because I find like piano has a different emotional outlet than than singing, you know, you can really put your anger into the keys when you can't do that when you're singing so much. Um, <laughs> it was great therapy. Um, and I always loved to sing. Um, my parents took me to operas when I was like seven years old, and I fell in love with it, and I was like, I want to do that. I was also a ballet dancer, but there's something so sort of visceral about opera, right? It's very gritty. Um, but I was terrified to perform. Terrified, absolutely terrified. So from about the age of, um, you know, 11, even to my early 20s, I would say, I was pretty scared of performing and lacked a lot of And um, strangely enough, I went into music performance at university. Like, I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> But I think I think there was something within me that knew that I would persevere somehow. So um, yeah, I definitely lacked in confidence. <laughs> yeah, no, I know, and, and it's interesting about piano because I started when I was a pianist too, and. Yeah. It's weird because you can throw all your emotions and you can almost be terrified on stage and no one will know. But then the minute you take that piano away and it's almost like a safety blanket, I find like myself. And so then you step away and you stand in front of that like, microphone or just the audience if it's an opera and you're like, ah, I can't do this. Yeah. 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 I had a different experience. I didn't like playing piano. Oh, really? Oh. I So even though I was scared of performing, I would prefer to sing public than play piano. I don't know why. I guess I trust oh. that part of my body better than my fingers. Oh, interesting. Yeah. No, for me, even to this day, my piano is my safety blanket. So that's why I like performing with my piano. Yeah. You're like, <laughs> yes, I can like, yeah. And then I don't have to directly look at the audience. Yeah. 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 Um, I know for myself, um, that a lot of my musical development is has been and when I'm working with my students it's often mental mm -hmm. um and I often see this in performance I mean like you go to festivals and you're just like oh that kid could play so well but then you walk on stage and it's like they just crash mm -hmm. um and then it often like I think it's come from a mindset like so how like when you're working with students how do you break that kind of mindset well I think it's one of the things that I wish that I had had when I was in the university was confident tools of how to build confidence and how to overcome, you know, stage fright. But it wasn't even stage fright, but it was, you know, worrying about not being absolutely in my song or something. You know, I mean, I was, I went to the university of Toronto 
show voice performance. It's a pretty intense program. And um, I, I, I just worried a lot about not being absolutely perfect, which is, yes, it is important, but it's not the most important thing, right? Um, and one of the things that helped me was this book called Power Performance for Singers. Do you know that book? I've heard of it. Yes. I haven't read it though. Yeah. So it's, it's, um, it's done by some sports psychologists and it talks a lot about training our brains. So specifically training our brains to build confidence, picturing yourself um, doing a performance and succeeding, that sort of thing. Um, there are other things like uh, any worries that you might have, you can, you know, meditate, write them down on a piece of paper, put them in a box and say, I'll deal with you later. And then later go up and open the box so that those worries are put away. Um, and there are a bunch of different strategies in that book that really helped. Um, that's something that I sort of do with my students, but I, one of the most important things that I do, I think is that I make sure my students have a really strong emotional connection to the pieces that they're performing and a well mapped out emotion, emotional connection. So, you know, we do this emotional road mapping sort of thing. I make sure that they develop the character um, and the backstory really, really, really strongly because I feel that if they have a strong backstory and they have, they have a very, you know, rich image in their head of where they are when they're performing this or singing this song, then the reality of the space that they're in actually kind of disappears. So that's one thing I do with them. Yeah. Yeah, no, I do that too. Um, I didn't actually realize it was from that book. It's interesting. Um, I don't think that is. That's oh, that is. Okay. Yeah. I had a t teacher do that yeah. with me. Um, actually, it was interesting. I remember being, again, a performance major mm -hmm. and my, my actually, well, I did piano performance. And so my, my, t my teacher was like, you need to talk to like the basketball coach. Yeah. <laughs> and so I did. And then I remember him working through a lot of those things with me. Like he was so sweet. I, I like, must have been really rad in front of this piano major going, hey, I'm scared to perform. How do I get <laughs> over it? But yeah, no, really that emotional attack. And I think that's why like I really encourage my students to go take acting and stuff too, because they can really get over that fear, right? Because it's developing that character. And it doesn't have to be the, like if they're doing like a musical or opera, it doesn't have to be exactly what's in that opera or musical. They can create their own sort of storyline and develop it. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's really cool. Yeah. yeah it is, and it, it works really well and it can work from, you know, young kids to, you know, anyone. Really. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be the exact story because often I mean I'm working with one of my university students right now and um, we're doing pretty funny and uh, you know she hasn't had that kind of experience I mean it's such a tragic song so we're trying to find parallels what what it, what are the emotions she's feeling what is the journey she's on and what are the parallels in her life that tie in with that and we found some things and I think it's really going to help solidify that for her so um, that's true, that question, because that's something that I, because I work more with teenagers, and one thing that I struggle is, um, is trying to get them to actually find those parallels, or if they, they do, and I, like, I mean, often, you know, teenagers, they like to talk, so you know they have those parallels, but then when you try to get them to discuss it, and you're like, hey, like, how, like, what, what parallels, and they, they kind of shut down, is there tools that you kind of use when they do try to shut down? So if they shut down and they don't want to share with me, I'll usually bring it into the realm of fiction. So, you know, because sometimes, and I understand this, teenagers don't always want to talk about their feelings or, or, or their own experiences. So I'll say, it doesn't have to be you. It can be a character in a book you've read or a TV show or um, a film. Mm -hmm. And you can, can you put yourself into that character's shoes and take the journey that way and and actually that's a really nice way of building confidence as well it's it's interesting how you know even the most shy people can sometimes find new confidence and um you know new expression when they pretend they're not themselves so. yeah yeah they say that often like comedians are actually really shy people it, yeah yeah and it's like you would never know that on stage, but in person, they're like, oh, hey, whatever. Yeah. 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 
dual personality. <laughs> well, yeah, Beyonce, doesn't she have, like, that whole, like, second personality when she performs? Yeah. Forget which, I forget what her, her uh, alter ego is. But, yeah, she has, like, this whole other thing, yeah. So, yeah. I remember doing some workshops where we were encouraged to like walk on stage as different characters and perform as different characters. And it was really freeing in a way because yes, you want to be yourself on stage, but also it's like kind of fun to pretend to be someone famous or someone completely outside of yourself because then it doesn't matter so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can have fun with it. Yeah, I did want to say that when I have students that have severe performance anxiety which I have um, it's really really important to set goals tiny tiny little goals for them so I had one student in particular who I've been teaching since she was six so ten years now terrified to perform and unfortunately in a few of our recitals had the experience of her grandparents being like you need to sing louder, like sitting in the audience and doing this and this sort of thing, which is so unfortunately detrimental. And um, so first thing I did was I actually talked to her parents and I was like, so you need to change the way your family is viewing this. And, you know, even if they can't hear her, they give her kudos for standing up on stage because that's pretty terrifying. But then what we've started to do, because she decided at some point that she wanted to break through this. So we had little baby steps. So the baby steps would be um, her, you know, my next student coming into the studio and her singing for the next student and the student's mom. Aww. Yeah. Or her singing for like my husband and my daughter. You know, little things like that, like baby steps, which was just as terrifying for her. But we did it. We almost did it every week or every other week and she ended up do, doing provincials well that's awesome yeah well, that, that's like um the more you do something the better you're gonna get at it and i think that's also true like a lot of times like I, i've had over the years students who who were terrified of performing and their parents were like we're not gonna do any of that because they just like they're too scared and it's like no like you can get over that fear um yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Actually, I, I just remembered a funny little antidote. My, uh, a, a friend of mine is an accountant, and she's your classic accountant. She's very nervous, and um, not, ner not nervous is not the right word. She's very, very proper and very uh, reserved, and um, she's, she's not into performing by any means. And so she came to me, came with me to a recital or a festival. I can't remember what it is, and she was so quiet. And then afterwards, she's like, I really wish I'd done that when I was a kid and I was like why that you're not into that and she's like well I gotta do these presentations every morning and um that would have helped that so I think it's it's really important that yeah that if doing those little baby steps so maybe you're not gonna you know do a huge concert but you'll have confidence to do stuff like in daily life yeah yeah and the other thing I do for recitals is uh, I give the students all my students the goal that they would on the that's like that's sort of not optional. I'm like, you will be performing at the recital. But I always, I always say, if you don't want to, you can just say no. And there's like no, nothing wrong with that. We just go on and perform the recital and like pretend it never happened. Because I think having the goal again to work towards the recital is a good thing. You know, and I have had students that, work towards it, work towards it, and then they get to the recital and they might perform and then they're then they're like, nope, I don't want to do it. And I think that's totally fine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if, if you if you do it and you try it, I've had that with students too. Mm -hmm. um, and they're like, you know what, I love singing, but I don't like performing. And yeah. so then they, they, yeah, but they have to at least once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or at least work towards it. Work towards it. To yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh yeah, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think it's important that the goals for getting over performance anxiety come from the brain and, and are, are, you know, they're brought upon with, with the teacher and the student together. It's not something that we can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there, there, I've seen that, um, even my own, like when I suffered from stage fright, 
young when I was younger I had a teacher that just like no go out there and do it and it didn't matter that it was horrible and I wasn't happy the audience wasn't was confused and yeah <laughs> Yeah. I'm gonna cry, but yeah, yeah. it's okay. <laughs> and and you don't want it to be a negative performance experience because I mean, I'm sure you've had those performances, and we can. Oh, we do. Yeah. So uh, that's what I always say to parents. I'm like, you want to carry that that pain? Yeah. If you're yeah. not ready, I mean, you know, bad performances happen, and you get over it. But if they're really, really scared, I don't know. I'm not sure it's great to push them out on stage. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of my favorite uh, quotes is um, from Socrates. And he says, I can't teach anyone anything. I can only make them think. And I feel like this plays in with performance and, and anxiety and confidence as well. Because if, and it's kind of what you were just saying a minute ago too, if they're not active, in their learning, um, not just like, oh, go out there and do it, just like we were just saying. It's really, really hard for them to develop their identity as they develop their confidence. Um, so, because I feel like often as music educators, we are, we're, we're a lot more than just teaching music. A lot of it, we're teaching life skills, because they're not going to be professional musicians. So, yeah, so what kind of, um, things have you found over the last few years that kind of helped your students develop them? Oh, what exact tools? I don't know, but I do think, that I do agree with you that this finding ownership over the skills that you're developing is so absolutely crucial because it, it again ties into like the, the stages of learning, right? Going from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence and so on and so forth. And if a student doesn't have those skills and they don't know what they're looking for, they can't move forward through the stages of learning. Um, I, I, um, one of the things that I was thinking about is that like, I always, 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 always will say, even to my youngest students, like six year olds, I will say, how did that feel in your body? Did you notice that that sounded different? What can you tell me? Or even if, let's say we have a really wiggly student, you know, um, and I and I try and get them to stand a little more uh, still and, and strong, and then I have them sing, and then I'll have them sing and wiggle, and I have them say, you know, determine which sounded better or which, um, which they preferred in the end, right? And that's just, the, again, that ownership. And even with little kids, you know, them developing the tools, developing the language to feel things in their body, to be able to express how that feels. Because so much of what we do is, is mindfulness about your body. And, and unfortunately, our society, we don't really teach that very much, you know? So we're like, we're not taught to like, how does it feel to breathe into your back versus your thighs? Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, <clears throat> I noticed even like from when we were younger, like our grandmothers and our moms were like stand up straight and being being aware of our posture and stuff like that. But I don't notice this as much with the younger kids. They don't seem to be getting those cues. And so, yeah, it, it really affects, I find, how they'll stand when they, especially when they sing or even when they play the piano. It's like they're like in the weirdest position. I'm like, first of all, are they even comfortable? But like, yeah, I wonder where that sort of, yeah, like trying to get our kids to really be aware of their body and how it feels. Yeah. And, and that, I think that's a natural part of child development. Like it's not, it isn't actually natural for young children to have any awareness of where their bodies are. Cause I mean, you look at my daughter's six and she's very aware of her body and always has been, but then she has these moments of like extreme flailing. And I'm like, you clearly have no idea what any of your limbs are doing. Right now. <laughs> I know. I love watching kids walk down the street. It's like, like they're literally, they can't, they're skipping. Yeah. 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 There's like, there's all this extra stuff happening. Um, and so as they grow, they sort of become more still in their bodies. But I think it's important to remind them like, what do you feel? What is it? What are you noticing? You know, um, another thing that I will do to help, students find ownership over this is I will have a, a list of things that they might want to work on. So I might say, 
like calm breath. I really like the term calm breath. I never talk Ooh, about Oh, I like that. Yeah, I never talk about that's a lie. I don't um dwell on diaphragmatic breathing because it's not really useful. I think calm breathing, you know, the the quality of the breath is more important. Um so that I might have them say like calm breath, or I might have articulation, or I might have, you know, um, vocal fold closure, you know, so getting getting the cords together, if they're working on belting or something. Uh, so we have a list of things. And then I'll say so this week, when you're singing on Monday or something, you're only going to work on calm breath. So that's your only goal. And I don't care about anything else. Because are we, you know, let's face it, we can't really, we like to think that we're good at multitasking, but we're not. I mean, you know how hard it is to <laughs> singing in Italian and singing and, and if, you're, if you're sick and you have to think about technique under those circumstances. Yeah. So really having the focus of one thing just gives them that ownership and then they can have such great high quality practice. Yeah, because I yeah, because I find too like if you give too many instructions, they just like they don't know what to practice, yeah. and then it's just literally all over. Whereas if you focus it on that like this week, we're only doing this, yeah. right? And then you simplify it. Yeah, less is more. I always tell my kids. <laughs> less is more, and also slow going slow. I mean, that's one of the beauty of online lessons is that you are forced to do less. Yeah, you know? yeah, uh, yeah. It takes more time. So in a way. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but as a teacher, I feel in some ways less pressure to give like tons of tons of advice. I think my advice is kind of yeah. No, I've noticed. I noticed that like because everything is sort of moving slower online. Um, online lessons that we've actually in a lot of ways accomplished a lot more um, in the long yeah. run in this past year. Yeah, it's really it's it's one of those weird things. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, the other thing I want to talk about was sort of the responsorship, um, and, um, it, oh, sorry, I didn't phrase that right. Um, in mainstream education, they often talk about responsibility and ownership, um, to build in confidence. And I look back at my own sort of musical training and it, there wasn't really that sort of ownership and responsibilities. It was more a often being spoon fed. It's like, this is the interpretation. You need to do it this way because it's the right way or the correct way. And I, I noticed myself that I'm really instilling in this sort of ownership and this sense of responsibility in my student. So like, how do you kind of go around doing that? Yeah, um, I am all about responsibility and being able to express yourself and being able to express your opinion about a song and discussing interpretation um, and all of those things, because I think that's really important. And it gives, even if, even if the end goal of the interpretation, you know, if a student is like, I want to interpret it this way and it's wrong, well, that's a lesson that they have to learn, you know? Um, and, and I have had students that have learned that lesson. Um, I, I think having, I mean, I, I try and create a really, really, really supportive environment um, in my studio, not only between me and the student, but when we're in person between my students as well. And, and I have had students that are a little, you know, that, that are like, I don't want to go to the recital because I'm better than everyone else. And I'm like, are you really? Yeah, I'm broken. <laughs> There's always that one student, but yes, 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 yes. I mean, God love them. <sighs> I've, had, I've had some students that are incredibly talented and have careers, but I just think you can still learn from people who are not as proficient as you, you know? Um, and, and the reality is if you can sit in a recital and think, what did that student do well? And what would I say to that student if I were adjudicating them? Um, that's a great that's a great lesson for yourself because the reality is most of us end up teaching right so <laughs> yeah if you want to do a career in this industry yes you have yeah. to teach so, yeah you know like well, you've got to have something to say um, yeah. one of the things i do is i often have master classes with my students so i'll i'll group them in similar ages and i usually try and keep it small like four to six kids a couple hours 
and they perform for each other. And I will also have them work together. They might do staging together. Um, I encourage them to discuss things as a group and give each other constructive criticism. Because I think as well, like I just said, being able to say like, I really loved how you did this, but maybe you could try doing this even when you're eight years old. If you can say that in a nice way to someone, that's an incredible tool, right? And I think a really valuable thing to teach. So yeah, that's one thing I, I do and I love and I miss, I miss my master class. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, have you found a way to do them online or? No. I, yeah, I, same here. I do it with my university students, but not my students. Yeah, it, it gets too complicated, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's exhausting. <laughs> it's exhausting, and I feel like it's so stressful. It is. And I'm not sure if it's valuable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll still do our June recital in June, and it'll be online. Um, but I feel like it's more for grandma than than anything right now, um, which is really sad. Um, yeah. So I yeah. Yes, yeah, my students are doing that too. Yeah. yeah. My university students have juries. So are they are the juries in person or are they on Zoom? Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 I, there was there was potentially going to be an in person option. I I talked to all my students and I mean I gave them ownership. I was like, What do you think? And none of them wanted. Yeah. Yeah, no, don't blame them. Yeah, well, yeah. We had a huge outbreak at well for the community. Yeah, no, it's not, it, it just, it's not worth the stress of yeah. it all. Yeah, 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 sure. yeah. I, I also like, um, to give students ownership, I help them to, I would guide them, but I give them ownership in that way because I know, I mean, I was, I think I was a bit of a nightmare. Because I was, I was super picky in a repertoire when I was a teenager, you know, like I, because I played piano and I, uh, I was singing at a fairly high level. And so my teacher would just give me books and be like, find, find pieces you like. And I would play through everything and pick stuff. And then he would either say, yes, this is appropriate. No, this isn't this sort of thing. And we would go through it that way. And then eventually by doing that, I actually learned what was appropriate and what wasn't. But I do try and give my students that ownership as well. Um, you know, when we we try, you know, especially with music theater, keeping within good age bounds and a, a, a appropriateness, because that can be a real issue. Oh yes, they all want to sing, uh, you know, the hardest stuff possible in musical theater. <laughs> I, I have adjudicated some very interesting Yes, yes, things. yes. Um, yeah, same here. Yes, God bless them. Yes. I mean, and I know, I, I, as a teacher, I do know this too. Some students are like, I am going to do this song, and I don't care what you say. Yeah, and, and, and there's no use fighting with them, cool. but yeah. But what you say is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I try to strip it down, so if they must do it, it's like yeah. the most stripped down version, um, which is not, um, one of my friends actually, I forget, how did he put it? He's like, well, as long as they sing like, you know, 20% of the notes. <laughs> Yeah, so they, they get to experience the piece. Um, and I also say I, I, I have students keep a running list. And I'm like, this is great um, that you are looking forward to singing this material, but you are not there yet. You need to learn these materials so you can sing that. And I want you to sing it to the best of your ability. And yeah, yeah it's a bit of a, a little bit of a, a dance sometimes. Because um, I, I was the same too. And I wanted to sing the hardest repertoire. And, um, I, my voice could handle it, but it wasn't ready. And so, yeah, it was, yeah, it was always interesting. Um, the hardest repertoire? I just was like, what I like. Um. I mean, I liked obscure German lead. See, I avoided that like a nightmare. I was like, do I have to? Is there any way? Like, can I just do more Italian? Or, or can I throw in a Greek piece? And would they, would they know? Like, you know, like they'd be fine with that. Yeah, no, I, I avoided German. Yeah, which yeah, was yeah. not good either. I love the German. I love the French. I mean, it's really kind of weird things. But I mean, it makes sense because in a way, I mean, I love art song. And a lot of my 
I've done quite a bit of this. Yeah, you've kind of almost specialized in that. Yeah, so I mean, it's, I, I like those miniatures, but it was, you know, I'm poor teacher. <laughs> You know what, I, 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 I think the same way, but I think that's what probably makes us better teachers because yeah. we were that difficult student, so we understand that mindset. And so when they come to us, we're like, we got you. We, we yeah. know it. Yeah, we know exactly what you're thinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. But I don't, I don't know about other things about ownership. I mean, I like just like, keeping the dialogue and respect from your students. Like, mm -hmm. You know, even my youngest students, I want, I want to know their opinion. You know, yeah. I, I want to know what they are thinking about what we're doing because um, it's crucial. And I just think it's respect. It creates mutual respect. Yeah, that, that mutual respect, I think, is um, really important. I remember our professor said, um, he's like, it was like about, in the syllabus about plagiarism and, and cheating and stuff. And he's like, if I don't trust you, then how can you trust me? And it's a two way street. And that, I think that really, when he said that, that really changed my mindset as, a, as an educator to be like, no, I need to trust that my students, if they're feeling something or they, they want something, there's a reason for that. And I need to listen. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Yeah, no, I don't think they understood. I, I know I ended up taking two years off in the middle of my degree because of that. My, my yeah. mom passed away. I was like, I can't perform. I, I Everything, I mean, she was my teacher too, so my first teacher. So it was like, um, no, like, I can't do this, right? So I, I think, I'm so glad that our universities are acknowledging mental health and the importance of it. And yeah, I'm really thankful that our students have that now today, which, yeah. But again, I feel like we had to go through that Exactly. Yeah. But I mean, that whole, that whole idea of the show must go on. And I was like, really? Yeah. Really must the show go on? Because, oh. you know, I feel like, you know, like this is a pretty traumatic thing, you know, that I'm dealing with and I, I, I am doing pretty well, but I think I also have to acknowledge what's going on in my life. And that's only going to make me a better artist in the end. Right. So. Yeah. 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 Acknowledging where you are emotionally, I think is, really important mm -hmm. and with that like dealing with confidence with everything is understanding where you are and knowing you're not always going to be there but it's really important yeah yeah, yeah and i just think creating that supportive environment where students feel like they can talk to you and, and they can ask questions you know i mean i'm sure you see things in like technique and you get the blank stare <laughs> yes it's um, like ah uh, wait what, what? yeah <laughs> Yeah, 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 that's why I'm always too, like, if you, if you don't feel comfortable, sometimes I think you'll, like, they don't feel comfortable asking in person, and then I'll get this random text in the middle of the week, what did you mean? And you're like, what was I saying? What did I mean? <laughs> exactly, was I just going on one of my, uh, you know, dramatic, uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, that's all I have um, kind of planned. Did yeah? Did you have anything you wanted to add or? I, I mean, I don't know. Respect and love your students. That's all I can say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Listen to them and, and hope they listen to you. That's really well. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing this. It was so nice catching up. It's it. It feels like Chandel was like just around like yesterday, but it wasn't. So yeah, it's been nice catching up with you. No, no. This year has flown by in some ways. Yes, yes, it has. Yeah, yeah. But it's awesome to catch up with you. It is. Same here. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I will talk to you soon. Thank you again. Okay, bye.